Good morning. morning. Welcome to Top Hat Sunday. So St. Francis, as many of you know, led a life of incredible luminosity. By the end of his life, he had 5,000 followers, people swearing off their, their everything to follow in his footsteps as he followed in the life of Christ. And at the end of his life, he lay in a very small church outside the walls of Assisi, and the luminosity of his life was really down to a, a flickering candle. He was, he was dying after a life of beating the pulp out of himself for the love of his Lord. And he called one of his, his Franciscan brothers, and he dictated to him a few things. Part of it was a brief, brief history of the Franciscan order, and another portion of it was the prayer that we know popularly as Brother Sun, Sister Moon. That prayer comes to most of us through hymn 400 in our hymnal, right? We know that all creatures of our God and King. And Francis talks, of course, about Brother Sun and Sister Moon and winds and clouds and stars and and fast running water and fire burning brightly and flowers and then toward the end he gets to even you sister death Francis had been very very afraid of his death and as the days came closer he came to realize that even death was his sister as death held him in her arms and was to bring him to his Lord And the prayer and the hymn, of course, calls upon us to praise and to worship and to praise and to worship. Now, Francis was not a theologian per se, but he was brilliant at living a brilliant theology. And for Francis, he understood with every cell in his body that the world, the whole of the cosmos, was God's theater, right? And that in that theater, we were all to be troubadours of love in Christ. That's what we were to do. And that we were to sing the praises of God with our lives. Now, you may know that Francis himself loved to sing and he loved to dance. But Francis understood that our calling in the cosmos was to sing praise to God. It was not, uh, I love Bruce Springsteen, but it was not born to run. We were and are born to praise. And as you may know, hallelujah or hallelujah, depending on how we anglicize it, comes from the Hebrew uh, meaning praise ye the Lord. So we are to be hallelujah people with our lives. Of course, To praise God is to worship God. Worship is a word that literally means worth-shipped. In other words, our worth shipped heavenward toward God. That's That's what worship is. We are shipping ourselves. And God wills that we worship, not because God needs our worship, but when we worship, we are most alive. We have a great need for worship, not only because we are created for it, but it gets us out of ourselves. I know nobody who lives at some level in a very small world, the boundaries of which are our own imaginations, our own problems, our own, our own this and that. And when we worship, we cast ourselves into the heavens, and by casting ourselves into the heavens, we experience a psychological cleansing, a spiritual cleansing, a lightening of the load. My grandmother was a horrible driver. Some of you have heard me tell this story before. Every time in the car with her was a near-death experience. And I remember telling my mother about this, and she said, well, that's because when she drives, she drives by looking at the hood ornament. (laughs) And she was all over the road. 
And my mom said, I was still a pre-driver, and she said, well, when you drive, you look at the horizon and you drive toward the horizon. And the same is true in our spiritual lives. We are not meant to live our lives looking over the hood ornament of our lives, but to the holy horizon of the heavens. And it is by doing that that we straighten out the crazy steering as we try to move through the difficulties of our lives. The scriptures of the Old and New Testaments are a chock full of worship and not, not summarizable in a brief Sunday morning homily. They call upon us to worship in truth and in spirit. They call upon us to worship with our lives. They call upon us to worship in all sorts of different ways, but they most assuredly call upon us to worship with instruments and song and dance. We all know that music stirs the spirit, does it not? It is often the medical, metaphorical ship by which our worth ship is shipped Heaven words, of course. And as so many of you know, the Psalter, the Psalms, were the hymnal of the Hebrew people. So that would be a little bit like taking the Book of Common Prayer and putting the hymnal in the Book of Common Prayer and then taking out all of the music. And that is what the Psalms are. And if you spend time with the Psalms and read them, you will see over and over and over that they say what the appointed Psalms for today say. The first line of the appointed Psalm for today is, Hallelujah! Exclamation point. How good it is to sing praises to God! Exclamation point. How pleasant it is to honor Him with praise! Exclamation point. And then you'll see that it comes down as though those are the verses and then almost as though it is beginning again with the chorus. It says, sing to the Lord with thanksgiving, make music to our God upon the harp. And undoubtedly, at that point, the harp would come in. Now, making music is part of the purposes of God. Music is built in to God's way. I read a wonderful quotation last night by Sting, the, the British singer, saying that music was one of the last avenues to the spiritual life that we all had access to. And he noted that music had saved his life, that it had saved his sanity. And this music, which is built into the purposes of God, is music on earth, and it is music in the heavens. I love it that it was Brigham Young, of all people, who said, there is no music in hell. And many of you may have read Screwtape Letters, that great inverted book by C.S. Lewis where Screwtape is a minor devil and Screwtape is saying that there is no music in hell and there is no silence in hell, only noise. That's what you get in hell, just noise. So we know about music on this side of the veil, but we know about the music on the other side of the veil. Several years ago, I stumbled upon a story about a pilot who had, uh, whose plane crashed, and everybody on the plane died, and he died too, but he later came back to life. He also later became a TWA pilot. Uh, he, he said this, 40 years after this, he wrote a book, and he wrote about his entering into the heavens, and this is what he said. Music was everywhere. The worship of God was the heart and focus of the music, and everywhere the joy of music could be felt. A seamless blend of vocals and instrumentals. I had never felt such overwhelming peace. And we know when we read that great book, that book that befuddles us so much, the book of Revelation, that there is great worship in the heavens. And in particular, you re may remember those portions where the around the throne of God, right? We have the living creatures, the seraphim and the cherubim, 
and day and night without ceasing, they sing, right? They sing, and what do they sing? Holy, 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 which is what we are about to sing. And then around the throne, right, in the, the, the cherubim, there is the 24 elders, and you remember the 24 elders seated upon their thrones, and they forever sing without ceasing, you are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they were created. And then out beyond that, there is, of course, that myriad which nobody can count, that multitude from every nation who praises God, right? And they praise God while the angels bow in song, for they sing amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be your God forever and ever and ever and ever. And it never stops. It never, never stops. Because the being of God draws this music, this song out of other beings because the divine love comes to life in song and in music. John Donne, poet we all read when we were in high school, wrote a poem called, Hymn to God, my God, in my sickness. Hymn to God, my God, in my sickness. It was a poem that he wrote just after he had been gravely ill and thought he was going to die. And in the poem, I'm going to read you one portion of it in a moment, but listen, he pictures himself just outside heaven's door. And he is tuning up to the sounds of the throng on the other side. Just as though there was a little kid with a violin, you know, behind a rehearsal of a great orchestra trying to tune his or her violin to that ensemble that, that one day this kid hopes to join. John Dunn wrote, Since I am coming to that holy room where with thy choir of saints forevermore I shall be made thy music. As I come, I tune the instrument here at the door. And what I must do then, think here before. BP's vocation has been and continues to be to help us all who are on this side of the door to tune our instruments for that holy room, that heavenly room on the other side where we shall be music. His vocation is to send our imagination to the heavens, to give us that depth perception in our lives. And his vocation is to empower us in our human vocation to sing praise to God. Now we pray on our Sundays, Lord, make us an instrument of your peace. BP's life has been an instrument, note the metaphor there, of God's grace. He has been an instrument, so to speak, of the triune God's song of love. And his vocation is a high and holy calling. Like the prophet Samuel, you may remember, he was raised in the temple by the high priest Eli. And so BP was raised on the organ bench with his mother as an organist and choir master. He literally grew up watching sacred music. 
making sacred music, studying sacred music, playing sacred music, leading sacred music, and living sacred music. It is his charism, his God-given gift, his vocation, his art, and his craft. Now, just as everybody who is given a charism from God is not given that charism for themselves, but to be in service to God's kingdom, so BP's gift has been a gift to us. And in living out the ministry of his vocation with us for the past 20 years, he has given us a monumental gift that cannot be summarized and it cannot be put in any box, for it is like that mustard tree that started with a small seed. He has prepared a generation for our vocation to worship God in the beauty of holiness and to sing praises here and to sing praises in the life to come. He has helped us become ourselves, to become more human, and not only more human, but more holy. And these words are spoken in his honor and in the name and the love of the power of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit.